The Godfather? The Godfather. Gotta go to the Godfather. Godfather Soul, James Brown. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. I feel badly that you did the intro. I know, I know. I think, I think you we, say I think it, we you missed say it. it. Welcome to Get to the Hook. Uh, I am your co-host, uh, Charles Latibaudier. I am Eric Colley. Uh, he's the other co-host. I'm the other co-host. Yeah, exactly. And together we are hosting. Uh, and welcome to the show this week. Um, every week we talk about, um, you know, just some fun stuff, uh, fun facts uh, and information you may not know about the music world and some we're just going to remind you of. But we always like to base this uh, around things that are happening in the real world. And one of the things that we have been talking a lot about people across the country talking about the protests on college campuses um, that have been intensifying, it seems, every week. Uh, people feel strongly on both sides of this. And we're not going to get into the politics. This we're not is not an into... Israel-Palestine debate today. No. Right. That's not going to happen here, um, even though we probably could solve it. I mean, I'm sure, pretty sure. That's what we do here. Yeah, they haven't uh, got the podcast to solve the problems of the world <laughs> yet. So. Uh, but what we are going to talk about is music and protest. And there have been people who have said that they don't feel like the, that these protests are effective. Uh, Tiffany Haddish had a comment about that, saying that uh, this isn't the best way to go about it. One way that I think you can't argue is a great way to protest is music, because there have been some great songs over the decades that have really, um, really empowered some movements and really given people something to um, uh, to throw their 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 to rally around the rally around you know it, sometimes quite it's, literally sometimes. yeah sometimes it's just a beautiful melody or really you know poetic lyrics sometimes it's just a chant but yeah a good song when you look back in history at like these great social movements there's usually a song tied to them at least one if not lots of them right and they are effective over time and it, it like it literally gives people something to rally about it maybe played at a rally maybe a march where it's playing or even if you're just at home and you hear it it kind of energizes you. There's still songs, some of those songs I hear today, and it immediately takes me to that era, right. to whatever the movement was. It's what I think about. It can be inspirational to people. Uh, and, and, you know, I think when you think of in, in the modern era of music, and I mean, like, since, like, the rock era, the 60s is, like, the, the most fertile ground of it these kind the, of songs. The cauldron. Yeah, uh, the, where you where this all this really started. Right, with the Vietnam War, with the civil rights movement. You had so many things. I think a lot of people tend to think of, when they hear protest song, think of some white dude with a guitar, like an acoustic guitar, kind right. of that sort of folky kind of thing. And of course, there was that. And probably the, the godfather of this in the 60s was obviously Bob Dylan. Mr. Bob Dylan. There's a little bit of blowing in the wind. Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, I mean, right there, you know, Got to be free, like that was that was the whole thing, you know. And and throughout the '60s, Bob Dylan did those kind of songs and was inspirational to so many other people, from Peter Paul and Mary to through the decades, yeah. Bruce Springsteen, John Mellencamp, people who based their whole catalog. And basically. those songs weren't necessarily like you listen to "Blowing in the Wind." It it doesn't make you get up, and it, it's a it's a, a more mellow, reflective. Uh, yes, reflective, and it make, but it makes you think about at, at that time. It made you think about what was going on in the country. Um, and maybe it didn't make you, like I said, it doesn't make you jump up and go do something, but it does make you think about what's going on and how we go about changing things. And there were other, you know, at that same era, A Change is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke, one of the most oh. effective, beautiful songs ever written. Uh, then, you know, as we got deeper into the Vietnam War, people got more, there's, there's some anger there. You got like Fortunate right. Son, Creedence Clearwater Revival, John Lennon's Give Peace a Chance was more of the chanty kind mm -hmm. of thing. War Pigs by Black Sabbath. Ozzy Orbex, Osbourne yeah. got political there. Yeah. Uh, but to me... Can't uh, forget Ohio. Ohio, Crosby, Ohio Stills, and Young. Is, yeah. I, I still... I, I hear that song, and I see the photo of, you know, the student who was shot by uh, National, National Guard. Guards. Right. Or, yeah. And it's, and it's the thing, is also to me interesting, going back and looking at these, is you see how history repeats. Yeah. There is so much to be learned, because in the 60s, they're, you know, protesting war on campus, the guards coming in, students are getting shot. It's, it's now. Yeah, it's, it's this it stuff. Is, it's it, I don't know if that's thing. encouraging because the country got through these moments eventually, but then we just wind up right back in them. So I don't know if it's we do. But I, I think that, you know, the the common thread here is that when people are upset, like we you have a right to, to gather and to protest and people should, I, you know, you want it to be peaceful. You don't want 
students or anyone getting shot. Um, but these protests can be effective. We've seen it. We can. Yeah. And in and, and this era, you know, like you said, Bob Dylan, it's more reflective and thoughtful. A change is going to come. It's more like introspective. And, but sometimes you just need a really good punch in the face chant song. And that is this song was a number one hit, War by Edwin Starr. I mean, that's, that's that one right, right, to, right to the point. War was it good for absolutely nothing. That's that is a that is a great one, and that is something you could chant. That is something that people were marching to, and it was a huge hit. And in that era, you also got the protest protest song, the anti protest song. Yeah, uh, I. By the way, I saw you know when we're getting ready to do the show, and Eric puts together a, a great list of uh, of songs that we're going to talk about. I knew the title of the song and I knew you're talking about Merle Haggard, right? Merle Haggard right here. Yeah, but I did not realize what his intent was with the song. And I had to listen to it and it's it's kinda you know what it reminded me of? Um what's his name? Uh Jason Aldean? Yes, Jason Aldean. Try that Aldine. in small town. Like I said, history repeats itself. So as you know, usually these protests, the, the campus protests are more you know, liberal, lefty right. leaning, of course. The right has their own protest songs, and there are people, usually it comes from country, like we saw with in, in all the Black Lives Matter protests, which we're going to talk more about in a little bit, but Jason Aldean, Try That in a Small Town, came out with sort of the, hey, yeah. you can't do that here. And the same thing happened in the early 70s and the late 60s. One, well, a song that was very pro-military was Ballad of the Green Berets oh, yeah. by Staff yeah. Sergeant Barry Sadler, also a number one hit. Country was, was very divided. One? Five weeks, that was number one. Five weeks? Because people on the right who were very pro-military right. and... Patriotic, and that's the thing in their mind. And they had something to rally behind. And, and we'll see here with Merle Haggard, who was a great songwriter and had a couple songs like this. To him, when you were, you know, attacking Vietnam and saying it was wrong, you're also attacking the troops and de facto attacking America. That's right, right. And we saw, again, the same thing with Black Lives Matter with the taking the knee and Colin Kaepernick. People were like, oh, you're protesting that. You hate America. So and so... I've never understood that people don't get I, yeah, what that America's was a weird about, thing but we're complain. not getting into that. Yeah. Uh, but I think I'll give Merle Haggard because he was a smart guy and a talented songwriter. Listen to this chunk of this song, his song, The Fight Inside of Me, where he's kind of trying to stick up for America. He's defending the right to protest because that is one of the most American things you can do. Right. So this was his song, The Fight Inside of Me. I don't mind them switching sides and standing up for things they believe in. When they're running down our country, man, they're walking on the fight inside of me. And he also had the song Okie from Muskogee, which is kind of the same thing. I'm proud not yes. to be a hippie and I cut my hair. Yeah. I get his point because, and again, now that we're so far removed from that moment in history, mm -hmm. the war in Vietnam, I think we all kind of agree was wrong. Right. But also I think the way the, the troops were treated when they came oh, back was absolutely. also horrible. And I think everyone accepts that as well now. That, yeah. Um, it was one thing to protest the war, but the the men and women who were you know, had to fight there, thats they were... That was awful the way they were yeah. treated, and and really the country is bent over backward. I, I think out of part of it, partly out of guilt, is bent over backward to make sure that our troops aren't treated that way when they come back from conflicts right. or wars that we are fighting now, uh, and they are celebrated. Which um, is, it, it's interesting that that is sort of the, that was Merle Haggard's more conservative talking point about respecting the troops. Then when in the eighties, when we were starting to you know come to grips with the way we had treated Vietnam vets. Bruce Springsteen does Born in the USA, which is about how awful this country treated right. those those soldiers. Which is and people on the right were like, no, it's a pro America song. Like it's not. It's, it's not what you think been it bastardized. is. Bastardized. Yes, but it was sort of its own protest song in a weird way. Like yeah. the Vietnam War had protest songs well into the eighties. Yeah, <laughs> well, because you had the artists who grew up around it, like Bruce Springsteen, and so yeah, that's Huey Lewis did one. Do you remember that? Yes. Walking um, on a thin walking line. Walking on a thin line, yeah. yeah. Who would thought Huey Lewis in the news would come out with a Vietnam song right. in 1984, but they yeah. did. Yeah, it was a weird time. You know, you had, so you had Vietnam, you had civil rights. There, there were so many things happening. Uh, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, Women's Lib, that whole thing of women going into the workplace in mass for the first time, really. And you had Helen Reddy, this Australian this singer. This is a jam. Shot to the All top right. with this song. I am a woman, hear me roll. In numbers too big to ignore And I know too much to go back and pretend I mean, that was a rallying cry for women. It still is. I Am Woman. Nice jangling guitar going there. It's a, yeah. it's a catchy song. It is. It's very catchy. But yeah. it, it really and just it, ticked off a lot of people at the time. 
Oh, I'm, yes. There was a story. She won a yeah, Grammy we, for it. As much as we all, you know, rally and that we are, that women, it's easier for women to get people to stand behind them now as it should be. But boy, it was not easy back in, even with her early ready, 70s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love, she, uh, just to further, you know, anger people, when she won a Grammy for it, she thanked like, her husband and her managers for making it possible, and also thanked God because she makes everything possible. <laughs> oh, she said that in the she, Grammy. She made <laughs> God a woman, and people really didn't like that. Yeah, the um, country was not ready for that at that point. Not at they all. Been. And one of the other great uh, feminist anthems of that time was actually a cover song, and was written from a man's point of view originally. Respect. Oh yeah. Aretha Franklin originally. Otis Redding did it. Which Aretha. Is- elevated that song. And I hate saying that because Otis Redding is Otis Redding. The, He's amazing. Way, when I first heard the Otis Redding, and I obviously growing up, I had heard the Aretha first. And then oh, yeah. I think I was in college when I heard the Otis version. And I was like, that it's it's a com- different song, but it is still a jam, but it completely changes. His is more personal. Like, I just need you yes. to show me as somebody working for you some respect. Aretha was the voice of all women and particularly all black women. Yes. So it was sort of a, a women's rights song. It was a, a, a black power song. That was also a whole subgenre of music in the early 70s. And the The Godfather? The Godfather. Gotta go to the Godfather. Godfather Soul, James Brown. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud. Say it loud. I mean, it helps when it's that I, funky and that catchy. I, I feel badly that you did the intro. I know, I know. I think I think you we, say I think it, we you messed say it. it. James Brown, the godfather of soul, <laughs> say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. There we go. That works yeah. a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and James Brown had a lot of those songs. One of my favorites, because he had really long song titles back then. And people don't thing. think of James Brown necessarily as an activist. Like, oh, he very not, much was. He was, and I think at the time everyone knew it, but it's not a label that's stuck with him, I think, you know, throughout the annals of, of history. I think because also- his music is so- The music powerful. is so fun and funky, you don't think of it, but like that title- yeah. It'd only be one thing, or another one of his songs. I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door, I'll get it myself. <laughs> what a great title. And he says that. Yeah. And it's and that's somebody who, you know, he was the hardest working man in show business. He built that for himself. And you had uh, Nina Simone to be young, gifted, and black at that time. Uh, Bob Marley's Black Progress. You saw this continue into the 80s. Oh, yeah. Public Enemy. That Public Enemy... That one's still, like, I'll play that sometimes. I'll say, like, we used to play it in college before, like, a football game. Not, like, Division One or anything. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, like intramural. But that's yeah. what we took our yeah, intramural yeah. football very seriously, yeah. all right? Take and what we, you can we, get. <laughs> and, you uh, put, and you throw that on? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, in the 70s, the Isley Brothers did Fight the Power. And then in the late 80s, for the movie Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee, which was its own kind of it was yes. a protest film, if there oh, is yeah. such a thing. Yeah. And Spike Lee specifically wanted... Chuck D from Public Enemy to do this song because he's like, you are the voice of this generation that does that kind of music. And Public Enemy gave him Fight the Power. Our freedom of speech is freedom of death. We got to fight the powers that be. Fight the power. Fight the power. I mean, that is like war. It's a rallying cry. That song is, and actually, I remember I wrote a, a paper in college or something about that movie. And I was like, that song is a character in the movie. It is that powerful and absolutely, and you hear it several times throughout the movie, and it's it's amazing. And uh, it, Public Enemy was the perfect artist for that because th- that's almost like they're like protest music the way Dylan was. Like nine one one is a joke, and brother's gonna work it out. That right. was their whole thing was yeah. being that voice at a time when there wasn't really one because there's not a lot of protest music in the eighties. Yeah, except weird. for one thing, there was a whole movement in the early eighties, all the anti nuke stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah. Peak of the Cold War right there. Every, I mean, you, you and I were kids. We, we yeah. remembered. I, believe me, living through, you're getting under your, your desk in school where I'd always go like, is this really going to protect me from As a, a nuclear kid, bomb? Like, this <laughs> like, is I was stupid. a kid and I knew it was like, this is not going to help me. <laughs> you remember the, the TV movie The Day After? About yes. The, that traumatized me as a kid. Yeah. Uh, I actually wasn't allowed to watch it. I, it was my, my mom said, absolutely not. Cannot watch that. Um, and I saw it years later, like. On VHS or something like that, but oh, oh, I, I no, I watched it on TV, and I think my dad regretted let me watch it because I like started crying and freaking out. If you I, don't I honestly, know the movie, it was a TV movie about what would happen if World War Three happened and nuclear bombs went off. And you, and as a kid, I just saw 
everybody dying, and it was so miserable and horrible. I was traumatized by I just saw the commercials, <laughs> and I honestly was traumatized well, by What's a good it. thing you didn't watch it then? Yeah. Uh, I, I, by the way, it wasn't that much better when I saw it years later because it's still very scary. It's, it's, I mean, the but, effects are not great because it was a TV movie in the 80s, but sure. it's such a bleak movie. But there were so many songs about this, this panic about the world ending. The thing with these 80s songs, though, is that so many of them were so catchy. People didn't realize. That I had no idea. I, I right. know which one. I, listen, this was just a cat. What I thought was cool about this song was like, oh, wow, like it's a hit song and it's in a different language. Yeah. That's probably why we. if you didn't hear the English version, you wouldn't know this was a protest song unless you speak German. Nena, 99 Luftballons is the German title. 99 <laughs> Red Balloons. Such a catchy song. Huck, listen how good this is. So when you don't know what the song means, when you don't speak German, right? So the, it's the, it's a story song about this woman and her friend buying toy balloons, and they release them in the sky, ninety nine balloons, and they're mistaken for a UFO. So these fighter planes come in to I investigate. Mean, Other countries see the fighter planes and get nervous. Nukes start flying. It's the end of the world because of some balloons in the sky. All because of these two women and their balloons. <laughs> Well, wait, I'm the wait, woman. That sounded wow. Wrong. That sounded you need wrong. to listen to I, I Am Woman mean, again. Wow. I didn't mean it like that. I just. <laughs> R E S P C T, Charles. But there were so many. 1999 by Prince was this. I mean, it's such a fun. It is a yes. all time party banger. But it's about we're all going to die. So we're all going to die. Time. Which, uh, by the way, for some reason in 1983, felt like that was real. It really did. Because at that point, 16 years down the road seemed like forever. Right. Uh, and then 1999 came and. Hey, Turns out it was the Backstreet Boys instead. And everybody. <laughs> <laughs> instead of nuclear <laughs> holocaust. And everybody was fine. By the way, just a fun little anecdote from here. I, the first time I saw Prince live was on New Year's Eve, 19, 1998. Oh, in um, 99. In Las Vegas at Studio 54, which is no longer there, but small venue. And he was performing, and he had said that this is the last time he's ever performing 1999 again. And uh, we went and watched Prince. Like, I'm standing on a balcony looking down at Prince 30 feet away from me. Uh, it was I'm so jealous. amazing. By the way, with Charles Barkley standing next to me. Wait, now you're just name dropping. Now, no, I, I'm going <laughs> to name drop even more. Oh, go ahead. Charles Barkley. So it was myself and my uh, my ex-wife. We are standing next to Charles Barkley and Nastasia Kinski. <laughs> now there is a, a throwback. I've yes. heard that name and in a Nastasia long time. Nastasia Kinski was there with her son. Mm -hmm. And you remember the poster, right? Oh yeah. Of Nastasia. She was naked with just a snake over. Everyone in college <laughs> at, our, at our age had that poster on the wall. And I figured out the timing. The kid who was standing next to her was the kid that was in her belly. She was oh, pregnant no. in that poster. Oh, and that's I, so weird. And I kept, <laughs> I turned to my wife and I was like, should I say something to him? I was like, nah. No, no. Let's just enjoy the show. Let's yeah. just enjoy the show. <laughs> I, used to, I used to look at you all the time in college, just <laughs> behind your mom's stomach. Yeah. All right, creep. <laughs> anyway. I'm sure she wouldn't have thought that was weird at anyway, all. Anyway, Prince 1999. Uh, yeah, also, uh, remember, I melt with you by modern English. I'll stop was, the world and melt with yeah. you. That is a nuclear protest song. And I did not know this until not that long ago. It's about literally Wait, melting like melting, together. yeah, now I get it's it. It's about bombs are going off, you're making love, and we melt and die together in the nuclear holocaust. You know what, Eric? Sometimes you give me too much information. I'm sorry, I'll take that now I back. can't enjoy that song if it ever comes on again. <laughs> or maybe you're into that. I don't know. No. <laughs> uh, Some people all... are. We don't judge here. Yeah. Uh, I kind of judge that. That's a little weird. Uh, Russians by Sting. You remember that one? Yeah. Where he name-dropped Oppenheimer because Sting always has to do stuff like that. I was Iron like... Maiden did a song, Two Minutes to Midnight. It was about the doomsday clock. Huh. Remember the doomsday clock? They still oh, have yeah. it. They still have it. When it hits midnight, that's nuclear I think annihilation. Like 90 seconds from midnight now or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. This is when it was two minutes to midnight back then they did that. So, But the thing, because those songs were so catchy, I don't know if they were as effective as protest songs. Yeah. Because it's just too fun to sing along to. Like It's hard to think about dying and annihilation when you're yeah. listening well, to the Sting one was kind of The Sting one was kind of down. That's that sting for you. That sting. I, you know, I just saw Sting last uh, last week. Oh, really? At the Beach Life Festival out here. He did not play Russian. No, <laughs> it doesn't, really, doesn't really doesn't really get the crowd up. Yeah, enough. it's not a fun song, and also you know it name drops Ronald Reagan, and it's it's very very much of its time. I don't yeah. think it would work as well now. Uh, but protest songs do still work. I think they've started to see a comeback in in recent years, which makes sense because. It's been a rough. There's been there's been, been a, a lot rough to protest. Years. There's so much going on. It's been a lot to protest. Uh, 2020, I think it's going to be weird to see how history 
yeah. regards, just that whole year with COVID and the election COVID, and, the, election and, and the Black George Lives Floyd. Matter protest, George Floyd. And uh, somebody I think people didn't expect to be a voice of protest was Lil Baby. Yeah. The rapper. I who did was, not see that coming. Uh, and that was, and I think that spoke to just how moved people were first by the horrific video of George Floyd's murder, um, but then moved by the response to it. Right. And, and clearly Lil Baby, a guy who, because of his music, the kind of music he makes, people- He was like a never, mumble rapper. People right. didn't take him that seriously as a, as a social protest voice. But he came out with this song, The Bigger Picture, and it was something different. There's too many mothers just grieving. They're killing us for no reason. Been going on for too long to get even. Throw us in cages like dogs and hyenas. I went to court and they sent me to prison. My mama was crushed when they- I mean, they a throw really, us in cages like dogs and hyenas. They kill us for no reason. A really important song because I felt like um, there were a lot of young people who may have been seeing what was going on but weren't paying attention or understanding what it was. But when they hear it from a voice, a young voice like there's like Lil Baby, that that makes people stand up like, okay, now I, I see what's going on. When so we were I saying, think it was really important. That is the power of these kind of songs. It does rally people and it does, it, it, you look at things in a different way than maybe you did. Just seeing headlines or just hearing people talk about stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why setting a thing to music, but it can really change your perspective on something. Yeah, it rallies people, but also even, even if it doesn't rally you, it educates you and you at least know, and it, especially if it's a catchy song, you go like, all right, now I understand what the issues are here. Maybe you don't get involved, but more often than not, you do. So. And and you get a different perspective. You know, you see somebody like the little baby who's impacted by that and has grown up with that. Hearing him talk about like sort of his experiences and what he's seen, it's different for people. If you're a sheltered white person, right. sometimes it can be like, oh, like I'm hearing it directly from the person. It affects. Right. Um, last year we saw a huge protest song, and this one is odd to me because. Politically, it got so politicized, and you saw one side try and vilify this artist, the other side tried to claim him, and he rejected both of them. <laughs> Everybody remembers this. It was a, a pop culture moment. Oliver Anthony's Richmond, mm -hmm. North of Richmond. He's Richmond, North of Richmond. Lord knows they all just want to have total control. Want to know what you think. You remember when that came out? It was during the Republican presidential debates, and... They even asked a question about it because the song debuted at number one. He is still the right. only artist ever debut at number one with no prior chart history on any chart anywhere ever. It debuted a Billboard number one on the Hot 100 because it went so viral that week, and he had nobody had ever heard of him the week before. And then suddenly the song is number one, and conservatives frame this as like outrage about the economy, about Biden's America, and you know there's a lot. Of, he talks about like you know working long hours for no right. money and all that. And so like Ron DeSantis and all these people were like, yeah, see Americans like the. You know, yeah. everyday working man American is really upset. And then Oliver Anthony was lifted up as this conservative he folk hero. And of course, people on the left were like, no, this guy's horrible and he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then he's like, first of all, Ron DeSantis and all of you on that stage, <laughs> I wrote this song about you. You are part of the problem. You are the Richmond north of Richmond. And he goes, but also he goes, I don't like Joe Biden either. And I think that's partly why that song resonated. Was, right, that it actually wasn't It's not political. Be, it was supposed to be apolitical and just to be, supposed to be about the conditions that Americans are living under. Um, it was supposed to, if anything, it was supposed to rally the politicians to pull their heads out of their asses. And, and shockingly, they didn't get it. And, yeah, and strange <laughs> that they didn't get it. Instead, they all wanted to just own it and, yeah. And so sometimes, sometimes the protest song misses the mark. But the, people don't just well, the, like it missed the mark of the politicians. But I think with the people, that song yeah. really resonated, and not just with conservatives. That's where it took off was like in conservative media. But a lot of people identified, right. and that song resonated with them. People who did not like, you know, this was a it's a, a redheaded guy in yeah. Virginia with an acoustic guitar. Lots of people who don't normally listen to that kind of music really connected with that song because yeah. there was a passion to his vocal, and you know, he meant what he said. Yeah. It uh, it reminded me a lot of, partially because of the the twang and the guitar. It reminded me a lot of uh, a lot of Mellencamp songs, like right. back in the, when he was singing about the farmers and um, just the conditions that people are living under. They got that message. There weren't politicians grasping to like own everything back then, um, like they are now. Yeah. So. Well, that's what he said. You know, they want total control. And I think Mellencamp's a good example because you know he did all those songs about, like "Rain on the Scarecrow" and about farmers and stuff. The difference between him and Oliver Anthony to me is that by the time John Mellencamp was doing those songs in the 80s, he was already a multimillionaire. Right. And it doesn't mean that he 
doesn't that care. Of right. course he does. And it's good that he used his platform for that. But Oliver Anthony was somebody that was still struggling day to day. Right. And then it's like winning a lottery. Suddenly his whole world changed. And he did he, not like it. Did he, did he win a lottery? I mean, because his I'm song, sure he made a lot of money off of that. He probably made, made a decent amount of money, but because it was mostly from streaming it, how much money well, does he, he make? He, was he sold, he sold he copies sell? too. That's partly how it debuted at number one because a lot of older conservative people went out buy music. They, right. they went to iTunes and it sold like 170,000 oh, okay. downloads or something. Oh, so right. not, not, he's not rich, right. but compared to what he, he probably made several years worth of his income in right. two weeks. Wow. And that's a weird change in life. And listen, man, I do he felt respect something. It. Felt something, and he wrote a song about it, and it connected with people. Yeah, I, I think whether you agree with his message or not, and there were problems. You know, when he talked about like obese people eating fudge rounds on welfare. People had an issue with that lyric. It's like, why are you shaming welfare, which was designed to help people who are struggling? Right. And he kind of he didn't apologize for that lyric, but he did say he wrote it like an hour before he recorded it. He's like, I'd had the first half written. They wanted to record it, so I just wrote another verse quickly. Right. Kind of shows. Um, but he, I think when he became this like media darling, he he's like, I don't know why this song's being weaponized as a political tool. Right. And he was so put off by the whole thing that he kind of didn't try and recreate that moment, which is actually really punk rock of him. Yeah. That he and that didn't, was uh, protest didn't music. lean into it and, uh, that he didn't lean into it and, right. do, and get, and get co-opted by one side or the other. Yeah. It was pretty solid. Yeah. Pretty solid. All right. Well, okay, so protest music, curing the, the ills of the world. Protest music, it works largely for the most part, hey, as long as people actually get like I said, <laughs> what the message is. All about. these things they were protesting, most of them wound up going the way they wanted them to. Like all the things, the protests for civil rights. We still have our issues. Right. That's why you have songs like The Bigger Picture, but we're a lot better than we were 60, 70, 100 years ago. Uh, I would say so. Yes. Women's rights, much better than it used but to be. Still a lot more to be done, so keep the protest songs coming. Right. All right. Uh, we will see you next time on uh, Get to the Hook. Mm-hmm.